Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our very first IBTOK exhibition. Um, some people in here look a little bit nervous, but I promise you, you're going to be fine. Um, when Miss Dunaway asked me to say something at the start, I thought to myself, I just remembered back to my very first TOK lesson. And in that lesson, we went down a philosophical rabbit hole about if you could actually know what your name was and what is a name anyway and how can you know anything. And I felt this sort of grey TOK mist descend and I thought, goodness, what is TOK even about? It's way too confusing. And I was the teacher. So I get it that sometimes TOK seems like a bit of a mystery. But what I really like about this new TOK exhibition is it actually connects theory of knowledge to the real world and you're actually using personal things to connect your TOK thinking to life around us and that's really the importance of TOK. So I am really looking forward to hearing what you've got to say, um, partly because it will be a personal thing for each of you, but also, it, and I'm hoping that each of you can enjoy having the opportunity of standing up and sharing your ideas on something that you've really thought hard about with the rest of us. The M4s and M5s who are lucky enough to join us, I hope that you, um, it gets you really thinking and that you can start thinking now about what you might include in your TOK present, uh, exhibition because actually um, it will be exactly the same for you when you do it in a few years' time. Uh, it would be remiss of me to start by saying, uh, without saying good luck to everybody and also to thank Miss Dunaway for preparing you on what is a brand new thing. So I'm really excited. I hope you are too and looking forward to it. Let's get the show on the road. Over to you, Miss Dunaway. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Mrs. Coven, for that lovely introduction about what theory of knowledge is. So this is the first ever Dwight School London Theory of Knowledge exhibition. Um, before we start, a few words of explanation, because if you are slightly confused as to what the exhibition is, well, you're not alone, because as um, Mrs. Coven said, this is the first exhibition ever all over the world. Uh, our students are being true risk takers, the first cohort in the globe to take on the TOK exhibition. Um, so why are we here today? Uh, theory of knowledge is a very special subject um, and something that makes the IB stand out from all other national curricula um, because it's not about gaining knowledge or increasing our knowledge. It's about thinking about why and how we know what we know. Um, specifically, the purpose of this TOK exhibition is to explore how theory of knowledge manifests in the real world. So the students, as you students very well know, have chosen three objects to exhibit hence the name exhibition, and um, to connect them to one of the 35 knowledge prompts provided by the, by the um, IB. And the challenge for the students is to connect three very concrete physical objects to one very abstract knowledge prompt. Um, so the students here today will show you in many different and individual ways um, how you can, how they can connect um, a theoretical and abstract subject like theory of knowledge to specific real world objects. Um, they have written a formal uh, 950 word commentary, which will be assessed and submitted to the IB, uh, in which they justify the choice of objects, the answer to knowledge question. Uh, but today they're just going to give you a brief oral synthesis of this, just to give you all um, an idea of the very important and meaningful uh, ideas and concepts that we have been discussing throughout the year and of course to give the M4s and the M5s a taste of what is to come. Um, the, the main goal, the main purpose for the IB's change in curriculum introducing the exhibition was to inspire students to relate the, the knowledge gained in the classroom to the world they live in. Um, and we hope that the words today will inspire you as well because this what we learn in the classroom and connecting it to the world, that for me in a nutshell is the core and the goal of what an IB education means. So without any further ado, let's move on to the reason why we're all here today, which is the first ever Dwight School London Theory of Knowledge Exhibition 2021. Thank you all for coming. Sarah, a true risk taker, first one. 
So the TOK prompt I've selected is, does some knowledge belong only to particular co communities of nowhere? So this um, exhibition will explore this prompt by reflecting on different types of knowledge and the cultural and societal rules that might place them in certain groups of knowers. So the first object I've selected, as you can see there, is a picture taken in 2012 in the Victoria's Secret Fashion Show, which features a model Carly Kloss wearing a Native American headset. So this picture sparked a lot of outrage in people who felt that something that was sacred to their community was taken as a way for Victoria's Secret to maximize their profit. And I picked this object because it offers the argument that some knowledge does only belong to a certain community of knowers. The second um, example I picked was the TikTok Food Food Challenge in 2021, where non-Nigerian people attempted to make cassava fufu and they ate it incorrectly, and they would often react to it with disgust. They would spit it out, and this sparked a lot of outrage in the Nigerian community as they felt something that was sacred to them had been taken and used disrespectfully. And this is another example where knowledge should only belong to a certain group of knowers. The third object I picked kind of offers a counter argument to the previous object because it was the first football match in uh, 1895, and it was in England. And before this date, football had strictly been for all males. And this picture showed that women could play football and that football was a type of knowledge that could be shared with multiple communities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. That was extremely interesting. And uh, Ahan, would you like to come up next? Thanks, one more slide. Yeah, so the prompt I chose to explore was um, can we explore knowledge in terms of can we uh, distinguish between knowledge, belief and opinion? And uh, the first uh, object I chose was a book that I'm studying in my philosophy course and it's called The Republic and it's written by a Greek philosopher called Plato and uh, it's pertinent to the prompt because it's widely considered as philosophical literature which associates it with knowledge, but um, in, in the book, Plato's just expressing his opinions and uh, beliefs on uh, knowledge, um, so there's kind of an interplay there. Uh, my second object is, and you can see a page from it there, it's, it's uh, one of uh, Indian mathematician Srinivasa Ramanujan's uh, lost notebooks, and inside the notebook, he devised a way to sum up numbers that get infinitely larger, which is not kind of possible in traditional maths. So this uh, new mathematics shows how uh, Ramanujan's belief or opinion on how we should sum, sum up numbers can be uh, useful to mathematical knowledge. And uh, my third object was my cricket stumps. Um, and I think it's a, a wider representation of uh, technology and sport. So similar to VAR and cricket, uh, technology is used to try and get the most accurate decision as possible. And um, there's kind of, it's, it's an example of trying to bridge the gap between the opinion of the referee or the umpire and the knowledge of what the correct decision is. So was it a pen, was it not a pen? And then that would be knowledge. Um, and then the decision would be uh, as close to knowledge as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ahan, um, for a really brilliant original commentary, which is quite impressive. I hope you managed to get a taste of what that was like. Uh, Ricky, would you like to come up next? Thank you. The prompt I choose is uh, a relationship between uh, culture and knowledge, because I uh, this our research, I found out some certain knowledge is actually shaped by the cultural differences. So um, the first item I choose is a calligraphy brush. I use it to do some calligraphy. And uh, I found out in English, we uh, usually call it calligraphy brush, but in Chinese, it's actually a pen. And I found out there's no proper translation of this uh, type of uh, knowledge from language perspective. So, um, so it's very interesting that um, 
From language perspective, when we speak the second language, can we always deliver the true understand of a, of this culture to another? Um, my second item is a box of tea, and this is very interesting because uh, why they saw service on the internet? I searched black tea. Where, where is black tea from? But from the social media, over seventy percent people said Britain. And only 30% people said, um, from Japan, from China, from India. But the uh, his, true history of black tea is actually from India and some, some part of from China. So this, uh, this is uh, very uh, related to the prompt because uh, without a... Uh, um, Sorry. Uh, no words. You were talking about the difference between how people think and where tea comes from, and the different ways used in in China. Um, yeah. You're talking about how people in China consider the smell and different aspects. Yeah. So, oh yeah, the point I found out is like um, something was not really in the culture before, but somehow and over time, we actually found out uh, it can become a part of this culture. So it's very interesting. And the last item is uh, graffiti. I took this picture in Marlowe Hill. And this is shocked me when I came to, came to London, because this is, seems really very common in London, but um, not, really, not really common in China. It's very difficult to see. But first of all, I think it's for, because of the policy. policy uh, but after I found out it's actually the punk uh, culture and the street culture, but this culture seems uh, were not really uh, popular in China. So, but lots of people think this is kind of art, it's a knowledge of art, but without the cultural background, uh, without the cultural, cultural background, without the certain cultural background, can we actually define what is art? Yeah. Thank you very much, Ricky. And um, thank you for bringing in actual physical objects because that is, in COVID times, this exhibition was a little bit different from how we would have had it. But it is great to have the real physical objects and for bringing your calligraphy pen, shall I call it now, and not brush. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, and Maya, would you like to come up next and present your objects? Thank you. So the prompt that I have chosen today is, does all knowledge impose ethical obligations to those who know it? So according to the IB, knowledge itself is defined as a justified true belief. But from this exhibition, I've actually taken that knowledge is relative and I think that it can be manipulated to suit one person's agenda. So this exhibition in itself is going to explore the prompt by reflecting on ourselves as knowers. And it's also gonna more specifically focus on each person's self-awareness and the ethical obligations that come with that. So the first product that I've chosen, the image is gone, is veganism. So it's vegan food. So I kind of looked back to religions such as Jainism, which have been following a practice called Ahimsa, which is non-violence. And this will result in people refraining from eating meat, honey, or products that harm animals or living creatures, anything living. So that in itself is an example of religious of religious knowledge that's imposed upon people and then putting it into their everyday lives. As well as this, there's Netflix documentaries, I'm not sure if you've seen them, such as Cowspiracy and What the Health. And this is just another example of knowledge being given to us and presented to us. So it's really hard to ignore it. I think veganism in itself enriches this exhibition because it highlights that there are ethical obligations. However, a lot of people choose not to follow them because I'm sure not everyone in this room is vegan or vegetarian. So my second object is a dress from Pretty Little Thing. I'm sure all of you know what Pretty Little Thing is. If you don't, it's a fast fashion brand, which I have personally bought from. So there are a lot of ethical issues that come with Pretty Little Thing. An example of the dangers of ignorance is in 2013, there was a Dhaka garment factory collapse in which 1,134 were killed and 2,500 were left injured. As well as this, there are vast environmental implications, such as 
textile waste, carbon emissions and um, water pollution. And from this, I've kind of gathered that people have knowledge, although they pretend that they don't, in order to ignore the ethical implications this would have. So, for example, when I um, got this dress, I was very aware of the ethical overtones and the issues that came with it. So my third object is actually a book called White Tears, Brown Stars, How, How White Feminism Betrays Women of Colour by Ruby Hamad. And this is a book that focuses on the issues of white feminism and how it affects women of colour. So personally, this does affect me, and I think it should affect every single person in this room because every single person has a job to do and a role to play. So I definitely recommend you all read it. So the book itself presents extremes of racism and sexism, as well as microaggressions, which are, all, which are very often overlooked. Without bringing attention to these issues and educating people on very important matters, then there will never be development and ethical implications will not improve. Um, so similarly to my first object, these sources directly set forth the ethical dilemmas and leave no room to neglect. Them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maya, and thank you for, for bringing another really important point of what an IP student is, bringing ethical responsibilities into our knowledge. Thank you. Kina, would you like to come up next and present your exhibition? From my TUK commentary, I explore the prompt uh, some things unknowable by discussing the limitations we face in learning new things through a language. The first object is the notebook I use in English speakers. I feel learning a second language is very hard. People use different languages depending on situations, so there is almost an infinite amount of words and expressions. Moreover, the grammar of one language is often very different from that of another language. And if we don't use the correct grammar, we often experience miscommunication. Acquiring a language is already challenging, so we may not be able to communicate and accurately convey information and knowledge through communications. The second object is the dialect spoken in Okinawa, an island in Japan. The people in, in the right photo are my grandparents and they speak the dialect. The dialect was spoken on a daily basis until the early 20th centuries, but now only 25% of the population of Okinawa speak the dialect. We can still learn the dialect at the museums, but, um, but what we can learn there is the dialect used as an exhibit and it's not exactly how it was in the past. It's impossible to know how the dialect was connected to people's life in Okinawa or how important it was for them. This shows some knowledge cannot, can, is impossible to know because the original form of the knowledge cannot be preserved for others to learn. The third object is the photo of Hanyu, Yuzuru Hanyu doing a quadruple loop jump an ice skating technique. When Hanyu succeeded in doing this jump for the first time in the world, the media explained the step of steps of the jump by using diagrams. However, because this technique is very hard to achieve even for professional ice skaters, most people cannot fully understand or imagine how to do the jump or know how it actually feels when they do the jump. So even if the knowledge is is fully transformed from one person to another. Some knowledge cannot be obtained because of the limited ability or skills of learners. Therefore, I conclude that there are some things that are unknowable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hina. Thank you for bringing up a really uh, another very important point, which is the aspect of language, especially in our community of um, second languages. And I would just like to say to everybody that the, the second uh, object, uh, the photo of Hina's grandparents, she actually had a recording, an audio recording of her grandparents speaking this dialect, which is at risk of becoming an extinct uh, language. And we couldn't find a way that uh, IB does not, at the moment, accept uh, audio files. So we chose this different way of representing the object. But I had the privilege of listening to it, and it was really fascinating. So thank you very much, Hina. And Jan, would you like to come up next and present your exhibition? 
Right. So my prompt was, uh, are some types of knowledge uh, open to interpretation? And I chose three objects, a, a postcard from Shanghai, a chromatic tuner, and a jazz book. And I'm going to start with the jazz book because, uh, well, my knowledge, what the prompt made me think is that even though we think that some, that all knowledge is just passed on objectively, it's actually more often than not open to interpretation. And whilst this is usually more dependent on the type of knowledge rather than the knower, I think it's quite interesting. So the the book, yeah, okay, okay, nice, thank you. <laughs> so the book has like six hundred uh, famous jazz tunes, and even though they are the transcript transcriptions of the tunes, when someone plays them, they're gonna play them differently because maybe when I play it, I want to give it a happy vibe, and when Miss Dunaway plays it, she wants to make it more sad or mellow. So I even though play, but... <laughs> <laughs> even though it's gonna be the same knowledge, the same tune, it's gonna sound different. So it's the same knowledge, but interpreted different. So that's, uh, that supports the prompt. The second, uh, yeah. right, thank you. The second object, as I said, is this chromatic tuner, which basically, if you play a note, it's gonna tell you the, the note that it is by taking the frequency, telling you, and it also gives a sound so that you know, you know the note that you're aiming to tune your instrument to, and this cannot be interpreted. Uh, interpreted. This is just, you know, if you play an A, it's going to say it's an A. It doesn't matter if you're a saxophone player, if you're a clarinet player, or if you like sad music. It's still going to be an A. So whatever the knowledge that this provides, it's going to be. It's not going to be open to interpretation. So that warrants contrast with the previous uh, with this subject because. You know, this is not open to interpretation. And lastly, the postcard, which was given to me by a friend from Shanghai, it shows a very sort of sad and gloomy city with some gray buildings, everything's kind of old. And that's what I thought Shanghai looked like. But then I went to Shanghai, it's quite the opposite. It's very modern, it's colorful. And it's, it, I mean, this looks dystopian and, and Shanghai is really not like that. And it's interesting because maybe this is what Shanghai looked like for this girl who gave it to me but it's not actually like that. So from the same picture, which actually we tend to think the pictures are objective, I think it's very far away from the reality, but she thought it was the same. So that shows as well that it's open to interpretation. However, you see a picture it depends on a lot of thing, things. So as I said, this leads to conclude that um, it's usually more open. I mean, interpretation is more up to the type of knowledge rather than the knower, because even whatever knower you are, you're not going to be able to interpret this in a different way, but you can interpret a picture or book in many different ways. So yeah, some knowledge, some types of knowledge are open to interpretation. So. Thank you very much, Jen, for a really interesting um, exhibition from a talented musician. I would have expected two prompts, uh, two objects focused on music. Um, thank you very much. And Jack, would you like to come up next and present? Uh, so the prompt I choose is, um, how can we distinguish knowledge, belief, and opinions? So take the first object as an example. It's a German hunger song, uh, Graf, uh, Admiral Graf Spee. And um, as, um, as a historical fact, um, the fact that of its uh, service record and Disarmaments, they are historical knowledge and it can be proven by um, archaeology uh, discoveries and the records um, we get from the notes at that time. Um, but still, um, the classification of it uh, is not a knowledge. Um, like the German uh, originally classified her as a heavy cruiser, it's because um, the whole is decided by the heavy cruiser standard, um, which is uh, reasonable to classify her as a heavy cruiser, but um, in, in that case, um, uh, it also has a much heavier armament than a heavy cruiser has, which is a um, 10 inches compared to an 8 inches gun. So um, uh, the British Navy classify her as a battle cruiser. Uh, this actually makes a huge difference in the history because uh, if it wasn't classified as a uh, battle cruiser, the British Navy wouldn't send 
a whole fleet to look after her, um, which will cause the um, this ship to make much more damage to the um, to the civilian and also the uh, merchant. Um, and um, the fact that um, these two classifications can't be proven right or wrong, it makes it an opinion. Um, and the second object I choose is one of my favorite TV show series, the Star Trek The ne uh, Next Gen. And it's um, the show itself, um, the creator, Gene Roddenberry, uh, actually created this show to deliver uh, lots of ideas. And one of the ideas is that um, the uniting human race in the uh, society without, um, without the poverty and uh, with diversity and all the uh, rights for everyone, um, but still, it's um, it's not an uh, opinion. It's not a knowledge for the fans because um, no matter uh, what, no matter if it's proven right, uh, it, it will be proved right or wrong in the future. The, flan, uh, the, the fans believe in this idea, and this is what it means to be a belief because uh, belief um, does not need to be proven right or wrong uh, for it to be ex uh, accepted. And the third one is, uh, um, I don't think you can see it quite clear, but it's an um, article I read um, months ago on Guardian, and uh, it's about the technology, or well, the technology um, destroyed the humanity or saved the humanity. And uh, for, that, for that one, um, the author writes about the arguments against and uh, supports this uh, idea. And, um, it's it's a, it's an opinion because um, it won't be proven right or wrong until we see it. Um, and nowadays, the uh, even the even the opinions, uh, the explanations are based on facts that the author provided, but it doesn't make it knowledge. So, um, in in conclusion, um, the uh, idea of if it's a knowledge or a belief or a opinion is dependent on the perspective and also if it's proven or not. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Jack. This was a really interesting exhibition. Uh, you put a lot of hard work and effort. Thank you for reminding me what it means to be a lifelong learner because you taught me things about battleships that I had no idea of. <laughs> so, thank you for that. And um, Marta, would you like to come up next, please? So when exposed to our outside world, it is up to us as human beings to how, to how we interpret, view, view it, to how we all do differently. Many prompt objects theories can be interpreted through a variation of viewpoints, whether that is through knowledge, which is thought through books and factual information, believe the religion that we have grown up with and led into the following for the rest of our lives, or simply interpret things and appeal to topics with our opinion, which is built through either what we've experienced to or have been exposed to. Today, I'm going to apply this concept within the question of how can we distinguish between knowledge, belief, and opinion. So initially, starting off with my very first prompt, which is a Lionel print, um, showcase the one at the bottom, um, which is a personal artwork regarding an endangered species that I've had to do. A Lionel print is a print printmaking technique and a variant in which is a sheet of linium and used for um, a relief surface. This, this piece was created in relation to the theme of extinction of um, Siberian tigers that I had to do, um, a species that has a high demand for their bone, skin, and other body parts in creation of species medicine, um, creation of medicine and furniture products, mainly in the areas of India and Bangladesh, um, where they have the chance of uh, being extinct. Um, this line of print managed to examine and distinguish the acknowledgement of factual circumstances that the species has um, experienced due to human act, um, to which can then be interpreted in raising awareness to further educate others within and prevent their permanent disappearance. However, in order to do so, an, an approach and a viewpoint from religion can be interpreted. For example, um, as in Hindu in relation to the city of Nepal, a tiger festival is held um, where hundreds of people join in celebrating and raising the issue and the focus on the massive loss of species. Um, this same aspect of um, respect for the species doesn't necessarily have to be in the form um, from a raised religion, but from a simple opinion regarding the love and care for the living kinds. 
indicating that all three factors are in one aim and prevention of the species, but is disti distinguished through the fact that opinion comes within preference and action, while belief is taught from an early stage, to which is then carried in, on within tra traditions. While knowledge is provided in proven facts, to which is then used to further educate either yourself, others of the effect that the species encounters due to humankind and act. My second prompt I would like to discuss is um, a Jesus cross. So, relating to the religion and the belief of Christianity. This specified prompt manages to personalize my relation to the religion as the theme of Christianity is what I've personally been exposed to from an early age, um, to which indicates knowledge. Knowledge is mostly taught and referred to um, initially from books, in which this case um, would be the Bible as it identifies historic um, events. Within this Bible and Christianity, it indicates the meaning of Jesus Christ's life and which offers people to promise and forgiveness of eternal life, which is stated as a fact within this book. However, this statement and the overall meaning can be indicated differently if viewed from a religious view, as Christians traditionally tend to believe and agree to follow several rules in, in, in order to achieve this internal form of life. Although when viewing this concept from opinion, many do tend to believe that Christianity can interpret um, or the book can explore um, several dark, darker themes and topics regarding violence, linking and distinguishing with the idea with, of the opinion that factual events might not be relevant to apply to modern individuals since it was written by ancient, ancient people many years back, um, viewing the religion and its interpretation from completely different viewpoints. Concluding this prompt that with the indication of cultural backstory of the object and how its religion can be diversely presented and be taken in from different views, um, distinguishing the three main topics. And my last prompt is focused on the presidential election tweet, which was tweeted by Donald Trump on November 7th of 2020, um, where the statement was tweeted um, on his opinion that he had won the election. Many of his supporters were in delight of the statement and then believed that it was true, as many um, many others of his fans were tended to retweet and share this statement. However, the knowledge within this context can be distinguished and managed through the opinion in its belief by, by when it completely wrong, as due to the election results. With this statistical and factual knowledge that was published, it allows a further clear distinguish regarding the tweet, which was then proved um, highly wrong, in which many of his supporters still remain in denial and support of his opposition, distinguishing opinion which was publicly tweeted, belief and support of his fans regarding the statement, to which was then proven incorrect due to knowledge and um, factual statistics. So concluding my three objects that I had chosen, um, in the form that knowledge is taught through a textbook, belief arises from religion, and opinion originates from thoughts, corresponding coherence and consistency go hand in hand with knowledge. Information ca that can be proved or disapproved is considered knowledge, something that can be taught and learned and distinguished throughout. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marta, for a very interesting um, exhibition for your object. Especially, I'd like to comment on your artwork, which was your personal creation, and a very impressive one it is. Um, and now, Shogo, would you like to come to the stage, please? So in this exhibition, um, I'm going to talk about the importance of material truth in terms of knowledge and um, language. So that, uh, that so the prompt I chose was um, how important are material truth in the production or uh, acquisition of knowledge. So the first uh, object is presented in this slide. And this is uh, about the introduction of effective method of English learning. And I did this in uh, when I was M5, and I did this as a personal project. The reason why I chose this object is because uh, this object enabled me to develop my English skills. Because the method is effective, since the method is effective, it accelerated accelerated my language development, meaning it caused me to be more a communicative person. So that still was important for me to produce my knowledge by communication. Because uh, before I on this method, um, I only I could only speak Japanese, and that was limited because uh, when I speak Japanese, the uh, the type of knowledge is different from when I'm speaking English. So by becoming a person who can speak both Japanese and English, 
that uh, gave me many different type of knowledge because the knowledge is different in English. The second object is the book, uh, the, and the title of this book is 1,100 Basic English Phrases. The future of this book is that uh, this book has both uh, Japanese and English translation of both phrases. And the reason I think this, the reason I thought this is important is that um, this book gave me many opportunities of gaining knowledge through communication. And, it's the, and it is the acquisition of knowledge. So using this book, I could gain more practical English uh, knowledge and it changed, the concept, it changed my concept of uh, acquisition of knowledge. Because before I, meet, before I met with this book, I only had uh, useless English knowledge, which I studied uh, when I was in Japan. But because of en uh, encountering with this book, I could use more useful English, which is more understandable for British people. And the, um, the, third, ob uh, the third object is a pen that I used since I was a child. The future of this pen is that the lead of a mechanical pencil is hard. So it's hard. It's hard to break, and um, so it's superior than other mechanical pencils because, yeah, like I said, before, it's hard to break. And the justification of the, uh, this object is that the, this pen helps me to record the knowledge in digital, uh, so in physical rather than digital ways. So while while people tend to memorize their knowledge in the digital world such as computer or laptop or yeah, whatever in laptop, in computer world. I think it's significant to express that in language because uh, digital knowledge might disappear because of the battery. Because, so meaning there's a limitation of uh, recording the knowledge because, the, for example, there is the uh, limitation of uh, storage, like, for example, 258 uh, gigabyte. And, but I think the knowledge written by pen exists forever unless it physically disappears. For example, I think uh, this paper, if you don't do anything about this paper, this paper can exist, uh, let's say, 100 years after. But, uh, we could, but the knowledge in computer, it might disappear because of the attack of hacker or because, it, because of its battery. So I think uh, these three objects have my... Uh, keeping knowledge and that uh, gave me to expand my knowledge. Thank you. Thank you, Shogo, for exploring a really important topic, how material tools help um, our position of knowledge, how they have helped you from when I met you almost two years ago and you were struggling a bit with English and now you've become this confident communicator through these material tools. And uh, as an IB educator, I'm very pleased to that one of them was your um, and five personal project. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Olin, would you like to come up and present next? Um, so my prompt is why do we seek knowledge? And I chose a book, a cave, and some antibiotics, which I'll explain. Um, so the pursuit of knowledge is a fundamental part of human nature. We always want to know more about our world and our place within it. It seems almost an instinctive thing. But you can, well, I thought of three potential reasons as to why we as humans do seek knowledge. The first reason is the need to understand where we come from, our origin. Um, I chose the book Sapiens by Yuval Harari, which is a description of all of human history from the very beginning with a strong focus on um, understanding where we come from and why we are like we are today. And I found it really interesting. And the fact that it was a bestseller shows that many other people share this desire to understand where we come from, our origin, seeking knowledge for that specific purpose. Um, a second reason for why we seek knowledge is because of simple curiosity. Um, we as humans are very curious. We constantly want to investigate and explore our world and what we do not know. And this in itself leads to breakthroughs in knowledge, although it can often happen in a coincidental way. Um, an example of curiosity is the experience of a group of boys which went into this cave called um, Tham Luang in Thailand. Where, and they just went in to explore, like, for fun, no other reason. And they ended up getting stuck then. They had to be rescued by scuba divers. And although in the specific case there wasn't any major breakthroughs in knowledge for the world, it does demonstrate 
this fundamental need humans have to explore what is not known on the basis of curiosity. Um, and the third reason that I considered is the human desire to constantly improve the quality of our existence. We gain knowledge to make our lives easier, better. Um, this has been the case throughout history, and a good example is antibiotics, um, which has saved a huge number of lives and was a result of extensive medical research prompted by our, des our desire to live better and longer lives. Thank you very much, Olin. I think you are a true example of this. Um, you are a real example of why we seek knowledge. You're a real inquirer. Um, excellent exhibition, uh, as was evident in your excellent written commentary as well. Thank you very much. Uh, Stella, would you like to come up next and present your exhibition? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is my TOK commentary, Learning Through Experience. My prompt being, what is the relationship between personal experience and knowledge, illustrating my understanding through my three chosen objects? Object number one being a zoogym. What is a zoogym? Essentially, it's a traditional toy that allows a moving stop motion animation to come to life through these slits when the world is spun and the animation comes to life right in the middle. And I remember being six years old, fascinated by this object, which I was unable to understand how it functioned, how something that wasn't on a touch screen could be so animated. At a time in society where technology is advancing so rapidly on the, verse, on the verge of an internet savvy culture, this, this toy, this object brought value to traditional toys and objects and my curiosity was provoked in depreciating my understanding on my knowledge, in depreciating my certainty of knowledge. It allowed my knowledge to expand, to grow, to develop. This object was able to um, was able to show me that by by not letting your prior knowledge restrict your bounds to what you're able to learn through personal experiences and through these objects which provoke your understanding and your curiosity, it allows your knowledge to grow. Object number two being a number seven L'Oreal red lipstick in the shade Flame, which my brother which my mother brought when we first migrated to the UK. And this was essentially her first glance into the Western culture of beauty. Now, this lipstick was a, I'm actually wearing it right now, but this lipstick was essentially a huge building block in my childhood. It exemplified values such as being, being feminine, being strong, being powerful. But at the same time, it was a contributing weapon to this stereotypical standard in society of what a woman should be and should is in a man's world. And through this lipstick, it exemplified all the values that I know as a woman and completely tested my knowledge of what makes a woman, the components of what a woman is. So through, by, by using a object which is um, used in society to objectify females, there is strength in knowledge when it's used as a tool, as a teaching tool for young females. Um, my last object is a Burmese grade one teaching book, which my family had brought, which my family had brought when we moved from Burma to the UK in 2008. Now I come to the UK at a very young age. I was, well, it's inevitable that I was soon to be influenced more by British culture than I am of my home culture. Now, this book was essentially my pathway in communicating since no one in my family spoke extensive English. So this book showed me, showed me all of my Burmese culture, showed me not only the dictation and learning the language, but the culture. So what Burmese natives ate in terms of cuisine compared to what Burmese tourists would eat and the social norms and the taboos of my culture and of my country. Now, this object was able to bring a piece of home back to my new back to where I am now. And is essentially essentially this, this being that the link between the personal experience of this object and through knowledge is how this object connected what was before and it, it showed me who I am. It brought a piece of home to me. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Stella. Uh, I really enjoyed all those meetings and conversations with you discussing your choice of objects and really showing me how your personal experiences have made you the knower and thinker you are now. And uh, you know how much I fell in love with your Burmese grade one book. 
Uh, thank you very much, Stella. Addy, would you like to come up next? So, hi. Uh, my IA prompt was, uh, are some types of knowledge more useful than uh, other types of knowledge? I, when I started this uh, proj uh, prompt, I found more uh, information on these objects than I would have thought I knew myself. My first object I chose is a uh, Harley Davidson 1950 uh, bike. This bike kind of represents uh, uh, the evolution of science, engineering, and how as humans have used more of this transportation than anything else. It has also helped us create new objects like iPhones, laptops, and uh, new hovering technology now that we use like electrical scooters and hover bikes, and I don't know what else. Then um, my, this also has uh, created over $270 billion in revenue over the, over the years, in past, over past two years. My second object is a MVP limited edition basketball. This basketball has been with me for about five, six years. Uh, I have played few, about 25 games with it and didn't win that many. But this uh, ball has helped me uh, meet new people, uh, get to understand new people's culture, help me communicate with other people that I didn't know played this game. This game is a very diverse sport, which is used all around the world. Then my third one object is a building. Uh, it is the building in James Place in front of the uh, Crimean War uh, Memorial. The Crimean War Memorial, uh, Memorial was uh, built in St. James, London, that com uh, commemor commemorates the Allied victories of the war that happened in 1853 to 1856. This type of knowledge is basically history. Uh, the type of uh, thing that embodies us as a human that helps us give perspective uh, of how we think and how we can understand new objects and everything. Thank you. Thank you very much, Addy. You have definitely connected uh, a knowledge prompt to some very concrete, specific objects, which clearly you're passionate about. Uh, extremely interesting. Thank you. Uh, Jeremy. Would you like to come up next and present your exhibition? Um, Chenga, would you like to come up first? There's a little glitch. All right. While we sort out. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Nineteen. Oh, there it is. Nineteen. There we go. There it is. Thank you, Chenga. Hello, guys. Uh, my topic is about uh, what makes a good explanation. So, uh, first of all, I want you guys to think of when we're explaining a system of knowledge that involves lots of prior knowledges. What we normally see uh, from like articles or websites, they may not define the prior knowledges properly. Uh, like they inserting the prior notch at the middle of the text or they doesn't even mention that at all. So to show a proper way of explaining that, I use the example at here, uh, the corner, that this side. It's a co code of the computer program. So what they did is they define all the prior knowledges at the first of um, first of your things. So when you have further on readings and you will understand the prior notch appears in that, so I think when you're dealing with a complex system of knowledge, uh, using the way of writing computer program is uh, pretty appropriate. And then the second example I want to say um, is that the importance of localization of language. What I mean by it is when you explaining something that belongs to another culture, you have to uh, cite its cultural backgrounds. So you have to explain like it's certain idioms or slangs uh, appeared there. So I use this translation of the German song Wiesing the Sky Shots and Mountain. Uh, the, the author did particularly good because he explained all the German words that uh, unique to the German culture there. And 
you can see that from the right hand side, there's the explanations of ordered words. And I think uh, in that way, I can, even I'm not a German speaker, but I can understand uh, what this song is referring to, and I can know its historical background. Uh, by combining the two points, uh, I want to explain one of the USB phone charger developed and used by myself. So um, what, if I want to explain to the general public, what I would do is I would limit the amount of the electrical knowledge uh, because I want to keep the audience in interest. What I would do more is I would use pictures to show it because picture as a way of cross-cultural and multicultural uh, like expressions, people from all the cultures and languages can understand it. And I will focus more on showing the final outcome of this thing is working because that will make the audience keep interesting it and uh, see how they behave. So I think that will be a more proper way of, of explaining knowledge to a common public. Okay. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Uh, I just want to say that uh, Jeremy's third object, that little thing, if many of you are any at all like me, you will have no idea how to build that in spite of Jeremy's excellent explanation. Um, I happened to pass by Jeremy, who was having a discussion with Mr. Carpenter about this one day, and I realized that he had built this thing. <laughs> and uh, you absolutely blew my mind. And I thought this has to be an object that takes part, um, that is part of this exhibition. So thank you for your great explanation. I still could build it, but thank you. Uh, and Chenga, would you like to come up next? So my exhibition prompt is, does some knowledge belong on these particular communities of knowers? Um, my first object, on the left is an image of Kim Kardashian at the 2018 MTV Awards wearing cornrows. Throughout history, African-American women have repeatedly been forcibly stripped of and discriminated against for wearing cornrows and other similar hairstyles. Thus, it has become a symbol of their persistence and their strength. In this specific context, the knowledge of African-American hairstyles belongs only to African-Americans due to their history and significance. Um, my second object is a book by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie called We Should All Be Feminists. Adichie states that she believes everyone can be a feminist regardless of gender. However, it could be argued and is argued by um, male exclusionary feminists that feminism is a lived experience and it should stay exclusive to women to protect them from further discrimination. Allowing men into the movement only gives them a chance to dominate it speaking over the women themselves on things only women have authentic knowledge on. It could also be argued that gender equality can only be reached with men believing in it. Thus, not the knowledge of feminism should be shared with them. In this context, knowledge does and doesn't belong to one group of knowers, depending on the perspective considered. Um, my third object is a tweet from Donald Trump. He made amidst facing controversy in 2016 for a leaked conversation. This conversation consisted of, a, of Trump and another man speaking disrespectfully and vulgarly of women. Trump excused the behavior by calling it locker room talk, as can be seen in this tweet. Um, the reason men like Trump are able to use the excuse of locker room talk to avoid consequences is because they claim that these conversations and the knowledge of their existence only belongs to them. Women aren't able to understand its depths and its excusable nature, therefore they can't possibly deal any retribution to them. The knowledge men share in these conversations doesn't just belong to them. It affects the way they and their peers treat women. Thus, it should be shared with everyone. All knowledge comes with an ethical resp the responsibility for the knowers. Some should only belong to a certain group of knowers so they can be protected, whilst others must be shared universally. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chenga, once again, for bringing the importance of ethical responsibility to knowledge and also to not being able to answer the question. Some, some knowledge belongs to some communities and some belongs to everyone. And that's why I love theory of knowledge, because some questions can't be answered. Thank you, Chenga. Drake, would you like to come up next? The TOK prompt I have chosen is, how can we distinguish between knowledge, belief and opinion? My exhibition discusses the differences between the content and the intent of three different texts that represent knowledge, belief, and opinion. For my text, I have chosen my math textbook, my grandmother's Bible, and my copy of the Communist Manifesto by Karl Marx. My own interpretations of knowledge, belief, and opinion are, knowledge is factual information that cannot be disputed. 
Belief is the faith in an entity that does not require you to justify your ideas. And opinions are a personal view about a topic which requires reasoning. My maths textbook, which represents knowledge, contains topics from geometry to calculus, and I can study the content knowing that what I learn is factual. My grandmother's Christian Bible, which represents belief, is a religious text, and the reader can decide if they want to trust what is being said. The Communist Manifesto by Karl Marx, which represents opinion, is a pamphlet that covers the benefits of communism and why the implementation is needed. In a quick explanation, I believe that you cannot, degree, you cannot disagree with knowledge, yet an explanation of the information is needed. For belief, I think that an explanation is not needed for your decisions, yet others can disagree with yourself. Finally, opinions require an explanation for your conclusion, and others can disagree with your conclusion. I wish that I could have explained my reasoning for my findings, but overall this project has allowed me to deeply look into these three topics, and it has changed the way I perceive knowledge, belief, and opinion. Thank you very much, Drake. Um, you've worked really hard uh, on this exhibition. You've thought about it a lot. And you've been really open-minded because I think that from our discussions, I know which one of these three objects you'd pick to take with you to a desert island, but you've been really open-minded about examining all these different uh, types of knowledge. So uh, thank you. And last but never least, Svetlana, would you like to come up and present your exhibition? <clears throat> so the prompt that I chose was, what is the relationship between personal experience and knowledge? And my three objects are a crochet hook, the book Never Let Me Go by Kazuo Shiguro, and A Newton's Cradle. So starting with the crochet hook, this means different things to different people, depending on how much knowledge of crochet that they have. When I first bought it and when I first started learning how to crochet, I didn't really know much about it. And when I first kind of started to crochet, I didn't use it well because I didn't have enough personal experience with it to know how to create things with it. Now I think I'm better at crochet. So I can, this is a tool for me. I know how to use it and my knowledge of it has expanded the more that I use it. And for someone who's, for example, an expert at crochet and has been crocheting for 20 years, this would mean a third entirely different thing. So people's expert, personal experience with crochet would, would influence how much knowledge they have of this object just by looking at it and also the knowledge of how to use it. Uh, my second object is the book Never Let Me Go by Kazuo Shiguro. All you really need to know about this book is that it's a sci-fi novel set in an alternate universe. So immediately the question comes up, how can Kazuo Shiguro, which, who obviously does not live in the alternate reality, be able to accurately like, portray it in his novel? And so, so here comes the question of, is it even possible to portray knowledge where you have pretty much no personal experience with it? And there comes the second layer is that the protagonist of this book is a woman. Kazuo Shiguro is not a woman. Is he able to accurately portray the life of a woman, even in a completely world to our own, when he is not a woman? Now, personally, I think that his kind of depiction of Kathy, the main character, is pretty good. But other people may have different opinions on it, again, depending on how much personal experience they have with like, either being a woman or the technology that is described in this book. Uh, my third object is Newton's Cradle, which I think represents a broader need for... Uh, we have a broad topic for humanity's need to experiment, to find out about the world. You can learn the maths behind something, the physics, you can study something, but, be, but until you actually go and experiment, until you actually go and take one of the balls and kind of let it swing back and see how the energy passes through and what it does, can you really understand what the object is, what it does, and its significance to humanity and science as a whole? Thank you. Thank you very much, Svetlana. Uh, your exhibition has shown um, that once again, you're a true theory of knowledge student, always thinking about how and why you know, and uh, discussing and analyzing the different options. And a uh, great, excellent, excellent commentary as well. Um, so Svetlana was the last of our students, and I'm going to um, call, ask Mr. Vedos now to come and say a few closing words. But just before that, I just personally want to say a huge thank you to the D1 students, it has been a wonderful year, a few bumps on the way, but you have been brilliant. Uh, we have all together been real risk takers. It's the first exhibition for you, it's the first exhibition for me, and I think you have done a fantastic job. So thank you very much, D1 students. This is for you. What three objects would I choose? 
I just wrote these down uh, on the spur, and hopefully this is a safe space and non-judgmental space, and this this passes all theory of knowledge requirements. Object number one would be my bike. The reason for my bike is the evolution of technology, but more so I got into bike racing and watching bike racing when Lance Armstrong won seven Tour de France's. Whether you think he won those or he didn't win those and he was stripped of those titles eventually, he still inspired me to ride a bike. And it made me think about the the flaws in the human condition and the flaws in human character that made him take drugs. Uh, was everyone taking drugs at that time, performance enhancing drugs so he got better? Was it the technology he used that it made him better? Uh, and all those sorts of things kind of percolated in my head when I was thinking about the object and why I would choose it. Um, and also, like I answered about the cricket stumps there, the bike is uh, a master in technological ed- evolution, aerodynamics, and all that carbon fiber, aluminium, all that kind of stuff. But mainly it was about the ethics of drug taking in sport that connected to the bike there. My second object, and I don't want to call him an object because it's my son, he's a human being. Uh, my son, Auden, uh, he would be with me now running around in this exhibition. And the reason why I would choose my son is... Uh, I was inspired in a recent psycholog- uh, observation of a psychology lesson with Dr. Agapol and some D1 students about nature versus nurture. And I wonder how much m- me and Lisa, his mum, my wife, as parents, are influenced in his future by the objects that we buy. We don't buy him dolls. We haven't bought him things that are pink, subconsciously or consciously. And I wonder that gender, gender stereotype. And I also wonder what Noah will he become? And, and someone talked about curiosity and I... I wonder if you did a graph about curiosity. Does curiosity die out the older we get? Does our thirst for knowledge and our thirst for being curious die out the older we get? And I'm I'm curious to know what kind of human being Auden will become. Hopefully, he'll become like one of our D1 students that we saw this morning. My final object would be an image of Fox News and CNN. I spent a lot of time in America, uh, and it made me, in the run-up to the elections and the presidential elections, when I was watching the news, I was thinking about what is true? And this idea of fake news came up five or six years ago. And who do we believe? Do we believe CNN? Do we believe Fox? Do we believe the BBC? Should we believe all that we read? Uh, and, and kind of what gets reported? Who decides whose story gets told? We're hearing about George Floyd. We're hearing about Black Lives Matter. We're hearing about climate change. Is that true? Is it based in scientific reasoning and, and knowledge and things of that nature? And it always makes me question what I'm reading now. And I'm very curious about this idea of fake news and Donald Trump can tweet whatever he wants and his followers will believe that that's a gospel when in fact it is absolute nonsense, in my opinion. Uh, there will be my three objects. I think that is a pass in the theory of knowledge world. Uh, thank you ever so much, Ms. Dunaway, for your feedback that will be forthcoming, I'm sure. Uh, and what struck me when I was listening to you all this morning is we are a continuum school. What does that mean? It means we do the primary years program, the middle years program and the diploma program. This is a great example of kind of another milestone of these wonderful programs. The primary years program finishes with the exhibition, a group project that year six do. The middle years program finishes with the personal project, an individual project over the course of a year. And the diploma program really finishes with this TOK presentation, but the extended essay. And it really does show the magnitude of this journey as you as learners kind of reaching this point. And your stories, your presentations were inspiring. They were highly personal, which I enjoyed. They were diverse. Uh, I'm always impressed by students who don't have English as a first language. To come up here and speak in English is, uh, it just, it blows my mind. It's like me coming up and speaking in French or speaking in Urdu. It just, it it baffles me. And I'm so immensely proud of of those people as well as uh, as everybody who presented this morning. Uh, So thank you for that. Uh, What's also very important this morning is this, what I am doing now, and what you all did just then is a life skill, much more in my opinion than a seven or an A star or a B or a C or a six or a five or a four. This skill of being able to present in front of people with a projection behind you, with notes in front of you if you like, or reading it off the cuff is is, is hugely important and that will stand you uh, through the test of time. And I hope the M4s and the M5s are inspired and enthused by our D1 presentations this morning. They were they were really excellent. A few thanks. Um, thanks to obviously Miss Dunaway for being the leading light of all things TOK and, and guiding you as students through this process. Uh, thanks to Mr. Bowery at the back there for his uh, constantly brilliant leadership of all things of the diploma as well and really kind of uh, fostering the next generation of, of, of brilliant minds, in my opinion, who are our diploma students as well. And D1, just huge admiration, huge respect 
Uh, huge kudos to you and what's been another challenging year due to COVID, bringing the world to its knees, but you have all risen to the challenge. Hopefully next year is smooth sailing. And by this time next year, you'll be on the cusp of getting some wonderful DP results and your university offers in your back pocket. It'll be a quick year next year, but this is a great kind of end to your D1 year and a great launching point to the D2 year. Have a wonderful summer D1 if I don't get to see say that uh, in the next few days. Um, that's it from me. I think that hopefully that was a, a nice uh, wrap up there or a decent wrap up. Not nice. <laughs> Pat myself on my back there. Uh, hopefully that was a, a decent kind of closure to what was a wonderful uh, theory of knowledge exhibition. The first one from Dwight School. And again, uh, my huge congratulations to you all for being uh, polished, poised and powerful speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Beddows, for a really wonderful example. I think Mr. Beddows' exhibition was pretty good. <laughs> um, just want to add really quickly, um, thank you to everybody who's been watching this uh, live streamed. Thank you to the M4 students for being a great audience. And I hope you're excited about what's coming up in just over a year. Thank you to the teachers. A huge thank you to the IT team and Sandy and Aruna, because without you, have done this. Um, I was a bit panicked this morning, but you sorted everything out as usual. Um, thank you, Mr. Beddows. Thank you, Mrs. Coven, and thanks again to the diploma students.